welcome back to another video. I recently took a trip to Miami, Florida for spring break. Given the many unique rail fanning opportunities that South Florida has to offer, I made sure to get trackside for a few hours on one of the days of my trip. This video will take a look at most of the railroad operations in South Florida. We'll spend most of our time along the southern end of Florida East Coast's Jacksonville to Miami mainline, which plays hosts to about a dozen FEC freights and numerous new Brightline high-speed passenger trains every day. We'll also take a look at passenger operations on the SFRTA Tri-Rail Corridor and the CSX Auburndale subdivision. I hope you enjoy this look into one of the most unique areas for rail fanning in the country. Our day begins around 10 a.m. with a northbound Brightline passenger train pulling into the Aventura Station. This station is one of the newest that Brightline has constructed and is an intermediate stop between Miami and Fort Lauderdale, only served by a handful of their trains. Brightline initially began operations in January of 2018, running between West Palm Beach and Miami with an intermediate stop at Fort Lauderdale. The passenger service runs along Florida East Coast's mainline, which has received extensive track upgrades throughout the past few years to accommodate the increase in traffic. Trains currently run hourly between West Palm and Miami, with some stopping at the Aventura and Boca Raton stations and all of them stopping in Fort Lauderdale. Here we catch the northbound once again on the other side of Aventura Station after it stopped for a few minutes with PTC issues. Between the Brightline trains, FEC freights are still running. Our first freight train of the day is actually an extra and quite a rare move. FEC number 434 is headed north with the Fram 13, an FRA inspection car headed to West Palm Beach. This car travels across the country's railroads making sure the tracks are up to standards. FEC offers a mixed bag of motive power and you never know what's going to be leading any given train. It's a great place to catch old EMDs like this GP40 still leading road trains. Brightline train sets are all manufactured by Siemens Mobility in California. They utilize two SCB-40 locomotives, one on each end of the train. 
These engines are a variant of the Siemens Charger locomotive modified for high-speed service. Each train set consists of either four or five cars, all with a unified color signifying the name of the train. For example, this southbound is bright orange, denoted by the orange color scheme on the train. The portion of the FEC main line in South Florida runs through densely populated residential areas. Consequently, almost the entire line from West Palm to Hialeah is a quiet zone, meaning trains do not blow their horn for railroad crossings. The only time you will hear a train blow its horn is in emergencies or for rail fans like Bright Blue does here. With the northbound Bright Line out of the way, the track is now clear for FEC Train 101 to depart Fort Lauderdale and head south for Hialeah with a train of rock hoppers, mixed freight, and intermodal traffic for Miami. Leading 101 today is one of FEC's LNG-powered GEVO sets, consisting of two ES-44 C4 locomotives with an LNG fuel tender in between them. All of FEC's GEVOs have been converted to run on liquefied natural gas, making this power setup quite common on the FEC main line, even though it is something that is rarely seen throughout the rest of the country. FEC is known for being the first U.S. railroad to implement the use of precision scheduled railroading in its operations. This means that with the exception of a couple very high priority intermodal trains, FEC runs whatever is in the yard at the time of departure. So 101 here has rock hoppers up front, followed by manifest traffic, followed by intermodal traffic that was all in the FEC Bowden Yard in Jacksonville. After gathering up all this traffic in Jacksonville, the train departs south, working smaller yards and facilities along the way where locals have brought in traffic from the surrounding area. This is the same concept that larger railroads implementing PSR tried to emulate. CSX, for example, would set up its system to run a mixed freight train from Chicago to Selkirk, New York, working yards in Ohio and upstate New York along the way. This way, all of the traffic travels on one long train making intermediate stops between Chicago and Selkirk instead of on multiple shorter trains. This saves the company money as they have to pay fewer crews and use fewer locomotives to get the freight across the road. The actual implementation of this system on a network as complex as CSX's or Norfolk Southern can prove to be challenging. However, it works quite well for Florida East Coast, which runs one single, simple main line from Jacksonville to Miami. Just minutes behind 101, a southbound bright line makes use of the high-speed double track to leapfrog the slower-moving freight train as it heads towards Miami. With no freight trains running for a little while on FEC, I decided to move over to the SFRTA corridor and check out the tri-rail action. I was immediately greeted by a meet between a northbound and a southbound commuter train at the Fort Lauderdale station. Do not 
on board this train. Again, this is a local tri Tri-Rail uses a variety of motive power, including EMD, Jeep variants, F40PH rebuilds, and these Brookville BL36PH locomotives, three of which power these trains here. About 10 minutes later, Amtrak number 92, the northbound Silver Star headed for Tampa, Jacksonville, and eventually New York, pulls into the station with two P-42 DCs leading the way. Outside of Tri-Rail, Amtrak is likely the only daylight action you will get on the entire portion of the SFRTA corridor. Four Amtrak trains use the corridor daily, the Silver Star number 91 and 92, and the Silver Meteor number 97 and 98, both operating between Miami and New York. Freight action along the corridor is few and far between. There is one local, L787, that operates in daylight as far north as Pompano. Additionally, L788 is a nighttime switcher that also can be seen on this portion of the line. In terms of road freights, there used to be quite a few rock train movements every day on this line. However, the implementation of PSR has brought an end to these unit rock trains, and they are all combined into the two daily road freights, M452 and M453, operating between Waycross, Georgia, and Hialeah, Florida, near Miami. While anything is possible, these two trains almost exclusively run at night on this portion of the line to avoid interfering with Tri-Rail's daytime schedules. Occasionally, one of these trains could be late, making for a daylight appearance, but this is incredibly rare. After Amtrak 92, we moved north along the FEC mainline towards West Palm Beach. Our next catch was a southbound Brightline at Boca Raton. Brightline trains use symbols designated by the letters BLF followed by a 700 series number. This train was BLF 707. The maximum authorized speed for Brightline trains on this section of the line is 89 miles per hour, although BLF 707 is moving a bit slower here. At West Palm Beach, tri-rail ownership of the former Seaboard Mainline into Miami ends and CSX ownership begins. The CSX Auburndale subdivision runs north from West Palm to its namesake town of Auburndale, Florida. Just miles outside of West Palm, the area that this line runs through becomes extremely rural. We set up at the south end of United Siding in Palm Center as we heard that Amtrak 91 was coming south on the line with a special interest unit second out.
This location is also home to one of the biggest online freight customers along the Auburndale sub, the Palm Center Auto Rack facility. Since I didn't catch any CSX freight trains on this trip, I thought I would include this clip from 2017 when I visited the area and did catch a northbound CSX Auto Rack train departing the facility. At the time, this train was symboled Q252 and ran mornings out of Palm Center. 252 has since been replaced by local train L773, which shuttles the auto racks to Winston Yard, where they are picked up by Manifest Freights to head north. Today, this section of the Auburndale sub sees the L773 turn in addition to the M452 and M453 road freights. There is also a local based in Okeechobee that comes down and works industries around this area. Similar to the SFRTA corridor, most of the freight traffic runs at night on this portion of the route with Amtrak ruling the daytime with the Silver Meteor and Silver Star running in both directions during daylight hours. After driving south along the FEC main line, we grab dinner at the Funky Buddha Brewery, which has a porch that backs up right against the FEC main line. Our first catch here was a northbound bright line. With Brightline traffic beginning to slow down for the evening, the floodgates open up for the FEC freight trains. First up is southbound Hotshot Intermodal 105 with a train of interchange traffic from Norfolk Southern bound for Miami.
Remember how earlier I alluded to the fact that you can catch some pretty cool EMD lashups on the FEC? Well, not even two minutes after 105 cleared, up came Loaded Rock Train 292, being pulled by two of EMD's finest locomotives, putting on quite the show as they throttle up. Ten minutes later, FEC train 208 follows the 292 north with a mixed bag of traffic for Jacksonville behind an LNG Jeevo set. Evenings on the south end of the FEC are particularly busy, and tonight was no exception. It is quite common to see multiple FEC trains at one time in the evenings, as the dispatcher tries to fleet them all over the Fort Lauderdale drawbridge at one time. The bridge can only be lowered for a certain number of minutes out of every hour before it times out, so it is common practice to lower the bridge, run a few trains over it in quick succession, and then raise it back up for boat traffic. As 208 pounds north for Jacksonville, I want to thank you for riding along today and hope you learned a lot about railroading in South Florida. Thanks for watching, everybody.